Hello, everybody. I have an announcement. The podcast is moving to Spotify. I signed a multi-year licensing agreement with Spotify that will start on September 1st. Starting on September 1st, the entire JRE library will be available on Spotify as well as all the other platforms. Then somewhere around the end of the year, it will become the According to Forbes, the Joe Rogan Experience receives somewhere around 190 million cross-platform downloads per month, and the series itself has been earning well over $30 million in annual ad revenue over the past couple of years. It is, without question or competition, the biggest and most influential podcast running. Recently, on an episode with comedian Patton Oswalt, Joe Rogan announced that the podcast would be moving exclusively to Spotify at the end of this year. While Spotify may be the most popular application for listening to audio, they're unproven as far as video. And thus, this announcement resulted in fans of the show bombarding the like-to-dislike counter with a majority thumbs down. At the time of this documentary's release, 4,000 dislikes lead the charge. Now, maybe this has something to do with Patton Oswalt's public behavior being viewed as unsavory. But on a video with the announcement isolated, the ratio is much closer to even than it should be for someone as well-liked as Joe Rogan. Listeners of the Joe Rogan experience are not necessarily thrilled with this decision, and aside from the lack of convenience it will cause for hardcore fans without Spotify, they have a reason to be. Podcast formulas are very sensitive. It doesn't take much tweaking to either greatly improve or completely destroy the entertainment value of a series. It is the most disposable medium, and for that reason, listeners will consciously or unconsciously tune in or out of a show over the most minor of issues. That could be a changing of networks. Make it easy, that's for sure. I mean, you may recall he, he sued he sued me, and you know that, that that tends to dampen a relationship. Adding a co-host. And uh, Marcus and I want to welcome in our newest co-host, the one, the only, Henry Zabrowski. Hey, everybody out there. Or removing a co-host. It's time for new. Sure. It's time for new. This is the final episode from New York City. We are also changing the name of the show from Tim Dillon's Going to Hell to the Tim Dillon Show. Even if the aspect being adjusted is not a focal point of the show, it can leave a lasting impression. In an earlier documentary, I detailed the decline of WTF with Mark Marin, which previously was the most listened to podcast in the world, and inadvertently met the demise of its relevance when Marin reached too high and brought then-President Barack Obama into the garage. The show afterward became sterilized, with Marin interviewing writers, NPR affiliates, and other stiff professional types, because a precedent had been set that this was a real and serious show now. It effectively neutralized its novelty, and since then, WTF has been purely driven by loyal Gen X Marin fans who have been with him since the start. The engagement between Joe Rogan and his audience, however, is not to be compared with Marin and his. Marin rose and fell at the height of podcasting's popularity when it was viewed as a strictly audio medium. While video podcasts were a thing in the odds in the early 10s, nobody really bothered with it outside of Ricky Gervais. Rogan was one of the first major players to adopt YouTube as a platform for releasing content and broadcasting it live. It's very likely that YouTube is the main source of his monthly views, with episodes boasting anywhere between 100,000 to, in some extreme cases, 20 million views. For this reason, Rogan had to anticipate backlash to come with this announcement. For the longest time, the average individual who isn't as in tune to most internet-related culture has had Rogan to look to as a pillar of rationality and stability in their weekly entertainment consumption. To assume that the majority or even half of those individuals would make the leap to Spotify and stay there just for him is naive at best. Moving exclusively to Spotify and staying there for years will cripple his viewership and likely change the dynamic of his podcast in an unforeseen manner. I signed a multi-year licensing agreement with Spotify that will start on September 1st. Starting on September 1st, the entire JRE library will be available on Spotify as well as all the other platforms. Then somewhere around the end of the year, it will become exclusive to Spotify, including the video version of the podcast. It will be the exact same show. I am not going to be an employee of Spotify. 
We're going to be working with the same crew, doing the exact same show. The only difference will be it will now be available on the largest audio platform in the world. Nothing else will change. It will be free. It will be free to you. You just have to go to Spotify to get it. We're very excited to begin this new chapter of the JRE, and I hope you're there when we cross over. It's hard to imagine that somebody as independently successful as Joe Rogan would not realize this. Then again, Joe Rogan's personality is much like that of the happy golden retriever who runs after a bone you only pretended to throw. There is a possibility that Rogan simply saw the number they were toting, which at this time is allegedly $100 million, and jumped on the opportunity with little thought to the fallout that it may cause for his show, his base, and potentially the culture. And who could blame him? Joe Rogan is a man in his mid-50s who publicly refuses to accept the idea that, through his show, he has any sort of power or sway as an entertainer or host. In the past, we've seen guests simply mention the power of his podcast, and Joe shrivel up at the notion. So you have such a huge responsibility here. You know that, obviously, but but because you have so many people watching this show, okay? Why are you trying to freak me out, Tom Green? A little You're responsible. Bit. It's all you're responsible. You're responsible for me doing this. How about that? For ultimately you. I'm like your kid. Yeah, you know, Patrice used to say that about comedians that, like, imitated him. Everybody is riveted by your show. And when you say something, it matters, which is different than when you do a show on your, you know, I do a podcast now. You know, i got a few people listening, but it's not like it doesn't matter, right? That's a responsibility. So it's a responsibility of the people listening. But you're, when you say something here, it will affect the, ch the entire society. It seems to frighten him to consider that lowly comedian Joe Rogan with the silly podcast where he talks to his pals could have an actual impact on things that matter. And yet time and time again we've seen Joe build the careers of comedians that otherwise wouldn't have made it past TBS sitcom regular and hold court with the likes of Bernie Sanders, Elon Musk, Mel Gibson, Edward Snowden, and Robert Downey Jr. The obvious talking point being how Elon Musk failing to properly smoke marijuana crushed Tesla's stock 9% for a short period of time. Okay. It's um, marijuana That's inside sweet. of uh, tobacco. Oh, okay. So it's like posh, posh tobacco yeah. posh. You never had that? Yeah, I think I tried one once. Come on, man. Okay. How does that work? Did people get upset at you if you do certain things? There's uh, tobacco and marijuana in there. That's all it is. The, the combination of tobacco and marijuana is wonderful. So I guess I asked this already, but like, that's a lot of pressure, Joe. I mean, because if you say something wrong and it's sending people, so you must, you, I'm just kind of curious, how much time do you spend researching? Because you know, you know so much information. I talk out of my ass 99% of the time. You, I have Jamie Google things mm, to correct mm. me in midstream. So is it instinct? Is <clears throat> it, are you able to see sort of the, the you know, the, the truth through the bullshit and then you kind of. Because, because I mean, well, you sort it out in real time. Because you're walking a very, you're walking a very fine line, and I think you're walking it incredibly well, and in, in a way that m many, many, many great many people are not. Right? They, cho it seems like we're in this world now where because everything's so polarized. Oh, I've got to choose to say this because that's what everyone's saying, and they're just kind of saying it because everyone's saying it. Whereas you, definitely straddle that line in a way that to me seems incredibly. Uh, astute, but also must be some pressure to, to make sure that you're right. Not until you started telling me about it. <laughs> now I'm thinking about it, freaking out, Tom Green. You know? Well, because you could easily be the you could easily be oh, here and saying, "Hey, you should. This is bullshit." I told Go him he was. I told him he was my daddy, and now he's being uh, he's being like. Well, Give me a little tap of that. Little right, tap cover that. I'm just trying, oh. just trying to. Say now he's um, so he's basically giving me the hard conversation. Okay. No, no, no. Just Are you gonna I, spray I, I, down I, the I, bottle. No, no, you want me to pour it for you? Yeah, I'll pour uh, it. Oh, Don't okay. touch it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah, how do you how do you make those determinations? Because a lot of people have made mistakes, right? Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of commentators too, have made mistakes who have yeah, said I make things. Too. I make mistakes too. If you're doing fifteen hundred whatever the fuck shows plus fight companions and shit, yeah. I don't know. Oh, JRE MMA shows is another fifty of those at mm -hmm. least, right? A mm -hmm. hundred? Jesus. We're living yeah. in a world now where you make I'm one mistake, make, and I make take a lot of mistakes, and they put it out They've there. They've already done that. People are watching and listening to Joe. They're taking notes, but at the same time, the worth of his show does not match that of downloading a brand new app, signing up for a service, and spending two minutes learning how to navigate it. The Joe Rogan experience is the fan you leave on in your dining room even when you're not there. This is not an insult to the quality of his program. 
Because again, it needs to be stated, podcasts are the most disposable medium. The average consumer will get more replay value out of the worst episode of Cheers than one of the better episodes of the Joe Rogan experience. But maybe Joe Rogan realizes this. He's not getting any younger. His podcast has been running for 11 years and only peaked recently with downloads shooting up from 16 million to 190 million a month in only a four year span. If the goal is to be successful, what more is there to do? If Joe Rogan values the power of his audience more than money, you will see him backpedal in the coming months and come up with a workaround to this contract he signed with Spotify. He has publicly announced that clips will be released to his YouTube channel, and I suspect that clips being released to YouTube will turn into something similar to one live stream a week without the JRE title attached to it. And we'll see if Rogan can dance that fine line for two, three, or four years, however long he signed exclusivity to Spotify. If he's making 30 million annually on his own, we have to assume it's for a relatively short period of time, likely less than five years. Alternatively, this could be Rogan's soft exit. It's an Adam Sandler-esque move of deliberately making a surface-level poor choice for strength and income to keep his life simpler and centered around shooting the breeze with friends. If that is indeed the intention, it's hard not to find a baseline level of respect for it. But at the same time, one can't blame his legion of fans for choosing not to endorse it. WTF was one of the earliest podcasts to feature well-known comedians sitting down and talking about their history, their lives, and opinions without being pressured for time or needing to necessarily promote a product. I think that if you listen to the first hundred or so WTFs, it's really a thinly veiled uh, uh, effort for me to, to get emotional help from celebrities. That, that was really... You know, I was, the therapy's going in the other direction. Absolutely. They're Dr. Melfi. Yeah, absolutely. You're Tony Soprano. No, no doubt. I, I think the reason like, uh, that I connect is I need to. Uh, I don't feel that I interview people. I feel that I need to connect in conversation and emotionally. I, I have a very, uh, I'm very adept at becoming codependent within seconds. Through his over-the-top persona and self-depreciating humor, Marin was able to disarm his guests. He was able to cut to the core of some in a way that even the most experienced of interviewers could not. The first two years of WTF in particular managed to shine a light on the New York and Los Angeles comedy scenes of the 1980s and 90s and the broken relationships those eras left. Compared to the program's main competitors, Kevin Smith's Smodcast and the Joe Rogan Experience, WTF was condensed, professional, and within its average 60 to 90 minute runtime, successfully walked a tightrope of being both free-flowing and yet to the point.